Afternoon, everyone. We're back. It's season four of the Crowdcast. Thanks so much for uh, joining us all. And who better to open up our season of the Farfish Crowdcast? Welcome, Kevin. Thank you so much for coming back. Welcome, Wendy. Pleased to be here, as always. I, I always um, enjoy my Crowdcast sessions with yourself because I don't know who's leading or who's following between you and I, <laughs> so I know we're going to have a good half-hour chat. And what a better topic to have a look at is in, we are in a boom market. So, you know, and oh, sorry, before I go in, I should really give you more of an introduction there for people that don't know you, because I know that you're so well known in the industry. So anybody out there that doesn't know Kevin, um, you know, you've been a, a great speaker on all of the recruitment network. You've been CEO of the um, uh, of the the rec uh, network as well um and essentially you've written a book on people's strategies you have been non-exec you know, director so lots of different recruitment uh people your whole career is a is around people developing them getting the best out of them so you know from my perspective um you know i love chatting to you and i know my audience will as well so there you go there's my intro um, <laughs> um so let's kick in um, and I want to really look at the marketplace because we've gone from, you know, sort of, gosh, la this time last year, not knowing where the jobs are going to come from. We've gone from the slow lane right into the accelerated lane and we are in a jobs boom. There's never been so many vacancies. Talk to me a wee bit more about how you're understanding what's happening in the marketplace right now. I mean, there's a number of factors that are being played out at the same time. But I, I mean, the headline is, you know, we've got over a million vacancies in the UK which is record numbers. So we've no, never had as many jobs on offer as we do today. Yeah. So that's the starting point. A lot of employer, employers are looking for people. Um, I think we've had a period of disruption through COVID, which has clearly meant that um, a lot of people have been on furlough, a lot of people have been at home, lots of organisations have needed fewer people. And then what's happened is a number of things have coincided. So Clearly, we've lost about 700 to 750,000 Europeans have gone home during the COVID pandemic. We, ha we were you know, hiring in via immigration about 300,000 people a year. So clearly, that part of the labour market has dried up. What we've also had, I think, is a lot of turnover where people have decided they want to try something else. You know, they've been at home, they may not have been working and they've reflected and thought, actually, I wouldn't mind changing career or doing something different. And then thirdly, I suppose you've also had furlough, which is just about to come to an end where, you know, at its height, we had 9 million people on furlough. We've still got over a million, uh, but that ends in about two weeks time. Mm -hmm. So I do think that that may help the, the uh, sort of dampen down uh, the overheating aspect of the labour market. But I think if you really look at it in its big picture, we have got three sets of shortages at play. So labour shortages, which is really about people that um, you don't need to, they don't have any experience or qualifications. It might be working in a, I don't know, um, a hotel or in a coffee shop or working in, picking and packing in a factory, working in agriculture, the sorts of jobs where you can train people quite quickly. Within a week, they're competent. They could be as good as your best performer. You know, that's one part of the labour market where we just haven't got enough people to do those types of jobs, partly because of what I've said around immigration, but partly, I think, because lots of people have uh, decided they want to do something second, uh, different. Secondly, we've got skill shortages, which have always been there and have been there for the last 15, 20 years, particularly in areas around digital, technology, engineering. But again, what we see now is in lots of professional spaces, in sales roles, in business development roles, in technology roles, you know, it's just becoming slightly wider. And that's where in the labor market, we haven't got enough people with the skills and experience to do the jobs that are available. And then thirdly, we've got something that I would call a talent shortage, which is really where employees are going, well, I can find someone that's got the basic skills, but I'm really looking for someone that's going to make a difference. You know, someone that's quite strategic, change orientated, great at motivating and inspiring others. So I think what we've got is all three shortages at play. So from a recruiter's perspective, it's a great time to be uh, uh, doing our, what we do. You know, it's a great time because it's very much a candidate driven market. Employers are going to be struggle, struggling to find enough people with the skills, experience, talent to do available. So they will turn to recruitment agencies. I do think it's a bit about where you play. Because I think there are different strategies in terms of different parts of the labour market. 
So for me, there is no doubt in, in all parts of the labor market, the one common factor is you've got to be great at finding candidates that employers can't find themselves. Now, that may be that you want to think about um, flexibility. You know, a lot of employers are ignoring part-time workers. We've got eight and a half million people in the UK work part-time, but only 20% of the jobs advertised. Mm-hmm. Talk about flexible hiring. So why don't you really tap into that marketplace? Because there's lots of people that would be looking for jobs where they can work in a flexible way. I think there's um, a bit about going deep. You know, your marketing strategy has got to be really focused on finding those candidates that the employers won't find themselves. If it's about putting an advert on LinkedIn and you get 20 CVs and five of them are brilliant, why are you paying a recruiter to do that, you know? I think it's more about how do you differentiate? How can you find the candidates that your your clients can't? And then thirdly, I think it's you've got to add some value to that experience. You've really got to be able to help the, the candidate think about whether this is the right job for them. And I think if, you've got to position um, and educate your clients so that they understand just because we have got, you know, there is a lot of talk about a million and a bit people coming off a furlough and, You know, there's lots of people out there that want to change jobs. They don't quite understand that they've got to work that much harder. They've got to think about their offering and their brand and how they treat people because people are making judgments on lots of different things. So I think the market's buoyant. I think it will be for about nine months. I think, you know, we get to the middle of next year. I think we will be back to a labor market quite similar to what was there pre-COVID. So I think you have got, you know, now's the chance to really make make hay when the sun shines, I think, but also really start to think about how you're going to position your business for the longer term. So, I mean, that's so interesting because there's, honestly, I press a button and you go and there's so much value there. I'm going to unpick it a little bit for our audience there because I heard that, you know, ultimately it's the perfect storm right now with lots of different areas of challenging to try and get candidates. We're seeing that all the time. Everyone is looking as well as shortage. But also what I was particularly keen in, in, in digging a wee bit deeper in there is to address that we've got to look at it from a strategic point of view as a resource or a recruiter ourselves. So if I was a recruitment owner just now and I'm running my business and seeing what should I, what strategy should I be deploying to try and make sure that my agency can make hay, um, you know, it almost sounds like you're saying, hey, we, we've, we've got an upper game here, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think you've got to... Um... I think there's a bit about understanding your market. And I talk to recruiters a lot about this. Quite often, you know, they don't see, you know, they don't think about the uh, the narrow uh, specialisms. And I think they really do need to understand those and understand what's going on. Is there a shortage in your marketplace? Who has got talent? How do I build a relationship with that talent? So that if they are thinking about moving, they would see me as the, uh, preeminent recruiter in my market space. Yeah. I'm a great believer in you've got to have a marketing strategy and a sales strategy and a, and, and a development strategy which is focused on your particular part of the labor market rather than trying to be a bit of everything to everybody because I think you end up not really adding value. You don't do the stuff that the clients can't do themselves. And I think you've also got to educate your clients in terms of looking at their employment offering you know, looking at this is what's going on in the market. You're not paying uh, the market salary. Your benefits package isn't the same. Your employer brand isn't as good as your competitors. So you've got to add value by when you're talking to the client, you've got to be able to have a picture of all of those things and be able to work with the client. So, you know, we've got to be true consultants. You know, it's not just exactly. about, you know, downloading a few CVs and whacking them through in front of clients. You've got to be a consultant. You've got to work on both sides of the equation. Help, you know, you've got a, that craft that Greg Savage always talks about, taking someone out of an organization, mm-hmm. you know, and dealing with all their concerns and issues that why should I change job is now the right time and my wife's not sure, wouldn't I be jumping out of the frying pan into the fire? You've got to be able to deal with all that as a consultant. But you've also got to be talking to the client about how they compete for this this talent and skill and resource that's in short supply. So you've got to be true consultant. So, you know, I think that's one of the things I would be saying is don't, you know, invest in your, your, your people. Make sure that they've got the skills to be able to do the job, but make sure they've got the data and they understand their marketplace. Because quite often 
we have people you know, just think this is easy. I phone up businesses and ask they've got a vacancy. Well, if you do that, you're going to get told yes most of the time. And then they're going to say, so how are you going to help me? Because I've already talked to some agencies and they've not helped me. So tell me why you're different. And if you haven't got an answer to that, you haven't got a strategy. And do you know what you mentioned the word data? If we've learned anything in the last sort of like two years, data is just power, isn't it? But I think this industry has been a little bit slower in actually using it in the way that you're you're taking it from there to build that picture in front of a client and have conversations because that will help them to be able to see you as a consultant level as well. And, and the other thing we've got an opportunity to do, Wendy, is put our fees up. We're no longer a commodity. This is a chance to show the value. And if the value's there, people will pay more for it. So I've said to quite a lot of recruitment businesses in the last three months, this is your chance to improve your fees on both permanent and temporary stuff. Because, But you've got to have a value proposition. You've got to show that you can do what others can't. And if you can do that, you'll be able to charge a premium. And that's when you really make money because you're doing the same amount of activity and getting paid more for it. So we really get into a virtuous circle rather than that vicious circle that we've been in uh, previously where people compete on price. If you compete on price, you're a commodity. You know, you're you're never going to be a successful business because they'll just say, well, I can get someone up the road to do it for 12 percent. You're charging me 14 because there's no value. There's no difference between your business and theirs. I totally agree. And what I've seen as well from certainly a lot of our clients is looking at different strategies of packaging their products up with different pricing points as well. Have you been seeing that from the industry in terms of project base, RPOs, employer value proposition? We've been talking about it, Kevin, haven't we, for years, and now I'm seeing them all doing it. It's great. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, if you go, let's go back to let's be a true consultant, you know, there are things that employers will pay you for. If you can say, well, we'll do a look at your, we'll do a review of your employer value proposition. We'll give you, we'll benchmark your your package. That you, I don't know, you're looking for call center stuff. We'll look at what's going on in your locality and see what competitors are paying, what the benefits are, so we can pitch you at the right place. We'll actually look at your recruitment process and think about how can we get candidates through quickly. Are we providing a great candidate experience? You know, all of those things. I think employers are interested in and i think what you know recruiters are well positioned to provide that offering but they need to have the skills and capabilities to do it and and, and that's the point you know you can't just say you're going to do it and then not do it very well because actually you know you're you'll damage your reputation and you'll be going backwards rather than forwards so that's the biggest challenge right now isn't it because just as much as there's a boom market out there for us to maximize on it recruiters are all complaining about trying to find other recruiters to join their company yeah, I mean, I, I, recruiters have always complained about that, haven't they? I've been, I've been, I was, I was in the chief, I was in the REC, the, the chief exec for ten years. I don't. It's a conversation I had with a recruiter. They didn't say uh, it's something about hiring recruitment talent, and it's clearly got worse, and will continue to get worse. So I'm a great believer in you got. You should try and grow your own. Mm-hmm. I mean, occasionally you want to go out and find a a big biller or, or, or someone that's going to add a lot of value, but I'm a great believer in. Recruitment, I think recruitment's a team game. I'm a great believer in building great teams rather than having superstars. You know, I'd rather have six people all doing great billing rather than having one superstar and lots of people that are failing. So, I mean, I think um, you need to think about who's who manages your billers. You know, have you got someone that coaches, develops, inspires? You know, the ability to recognize a consultant. You know, this person needs a bit of a kick up the ass. This person needs an arm around the shoulder. This person needs me to coach them through and help them develop. You know, people are are, are quite complex and they all need a slightly different response. Mm -hmm. And have we got managers that can really bring out the best of people? Um, But also, are we bringing young, bright young things in who have got energy and enthusiasm and want to be successful and are hungry and then taking them through a program? And if you do that consistently, you know, you will develop capability within your organisation. Now, you still have to develop people. You still have to think about how we reward them, how we recognize them, because you want to retain them. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I do think about attracting right young people to our industry and then giving them a great education is the right way to go, rather than trying to pinch talent from a competitor, partly because you just never know what you're going to get. You know, you're shopping. It's an expensive resource. You buy, and it takes you six months to work out, actually, they're not that great. 
And I've spent a lot of time both finding them, bringing them in, paying them quite a lot of money, and I haven't got a return. So, you know, I think grow your own wherever you can uh, and supplement that occasionally with, with people from the market. And, and I'm seeing quite good examples of the Kickstarter program on that, et cetera, as well, and sort of getting them in. So what, what's a big part of that is also I'd be keen to get your views on where do you stand just now with getting everybody back in the office, keeping a hybrid view or work from anywhere? What do you think the industry sort of should be looking at? Well, I, th- I think I think a lot of recruitment owners go, I want them all back in the office yeah. five days a week. Well, that's how we work. That's how we've always worked. <laughs> and I think you've got to start by going, Let's listen to my people, right? Let me ask the question. What would you ideally like to work? How would you? You've done it at home, so it can work. can work for you, can work for us. What's the ideal scenario for you? Now, when you ask your people, you're going to get a range. There'll be some that go, I want to come back five days, some that say, I never want to come back at all. And I think what you've then got to look at is, well, what works for us? And I've seen lots of employers going, we think that hybrid works. We think we do get productivity. People, when they're working individually, work perhaps better on their own. But also, we know that there's something, some value about them learning from one another, listening to conversations, doing team sessions, problem solving. So I think you often want uh, the best of both worlds. And and that's got to be something that you work out um, organizationally. So I think most organizations are looking for a hybrid. If you go too far the other way, you'll lose talent because other people will allow them to work flexibly. People have got used to being at home, used to, you know, making their own sandwiches and picking the kids up from school. And and I think one of the things I've said to recruiters a lot is, don't focus on the time and what people are doing, focus on the outcomes and the outputs. You know, look at what, uh, how many conversations they're having a week, how many placements they're making. Now, if they do that, whether they're in the office or out the office, does it matter? Yeah. You know, don't worry about the location too much. So I think hybrid's the right way to go mm-hmm. um, because I think there's benefits in both. Um, but you've got to listen to your people and, and don't be too fixed because if you're fixed, you're going to annoy and aggravate the talent you've spent a lot of time hiring and, and training and developing. My, my view as well is that whatever decision people make in terms of the company, um, be aware as well of the cultural impacts that that will have. Because I think a lot of people are seeing that as an isolation. Let's like just make a difference and this is how we work. But they're forgetting how the impact on a culture that will then make as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Culture is interesting. You know, one of the things I'm hoping recruiters have learned is to trust their people. Mm-hmm. You know, that's what I think we've learned through COVID is that we've learned that actually if we're not watching our people every minute of the day, they do the right things. They phone up customers. They get uh, appointments. They talk to candidates. They put people into jobs. And so you don't have to micromanage them. I think that's one of the things that hopefully we've learned is to give people a bit of room. You've got to look at the outcomes. How many placements are people doing? How many calls do they make? But I don't need to observe them all day, every day. Give them some scope, you know. You soon learn whether people are doing the work or not doing the work because whether they get the results or not. So I think it's about how we manage people and how we engage them. You know, I think if you trust your people, they'll trust you. Yeah. Uh, and I think they'll give you discretionary effort. They'll work a bit harder. Um, so I'm a great believer in you treat people well and you'll get great results. You treat people in a hard draconian way and you'll, you'll end up with um, a poor morale, the wrong culture. Um, people not doing the right thing. Yeah, no, I, I agree. So I'm going to jump ahead now in okay. terms of, you know, we've got, um, you know, we've got this sort of a very sort of busy market right now, but you've said there um, at the very start, you think it's going to go for another maybe six months. What, six to nine, what, what, I think. Six to nine. So what, what do you see happening and how we should be developing that strategy, not just to, to deal with today, but also moving on in the six to nine months? Well, I think the one thing is don't overexpand. Don't go mad. Don't start opening lots of branches. Don't hide loads of staff that, that you know, your business may not be able to sustain. So think about this period being a period where there is some rapid growth and big opportunities, but also think about your business if you were in a market as it was pre-COVID and what's the right structure, what's the right level of resource, what's the right team composition. So I do think, you know, start to think it through, look to the medium term, don't always just react and do stuff in terms of what's in front of you. So 
Um, I think that means I would say spend the time really thinking about your strategy. Where do I focus? How do I compete? What's the right resourcing structure? Um, how do I get the right mix of skills and capabilities within my business? So all of those questions that I think we normally have to ask ourselves, I think as an owner, you've got to find the time to do that. Otherwise, you'll be running flat out, mm -hmm. trying to get everything through the door. And you may over invest, you may over hire, you may do make some mistakes. And actually, you'll get to sort of that point middle of next year and go, I'm not sure I made a lot of money, a lot more money. And actually, the world's changing. I'm going to have to readjust again. So try and be a bit more thoughtful. You know, try and find the time. I'm a, I'm a great believer for owner managers to say to them, you know, you've got to spend at least half day a, a, a week working on the business. You know, not in it. You know, you may be doing stuff, managing people, doing client visits, supporting your consultants, doing the technology, looking at the data, whatever it may be. But spend some quiet time just thinking about, what are my numbers looking like? What's my forecast looking like? How can I grow my business in a way which is meaningful? And what do I need to do that? And what capability? So I think it's a bit about planning and thinking and, and strategizing and doing scenario plans. And I think, um, you know, ultimately from an HR perspective, because you're obviously very familiar with the in-house side as well, you know, they're going through the same sort of thought process just now. So, you know, it's a great opportunity, just like it was at the other extreme when, they were having to restructure around COVID for us to be having those strategic conversations with those HR talent clients as well. Yeah, I mean, you took, you mentioned RPO. I mean, there is a huge opportunity for clients to talk to them about adding value, but there's also the chance to talk about outsourcing. You know, you know, how big is your in-house team? You know, they're not going to be able to do everything. Why don't you get them to focus on that and we can take over this part of the business for you? Um and I think clients are open for those conversations. I think you've got to think about it in a very different way. You know, how you price it, how you structure the business to deliver it is significantly different. I think there's a lot of, you know, small agencies that think, oh, I'll just do an RPO, but then end up with their, the wrong cost base because it does, you need to, you need to structure how you do the work quite differently because your pricing will be different. Um, so I think there's an op there's lots of opportunities to be talking to your clients about how you can help them. Um, Joe, you know, I'm just going to pick up on that RPO because it's something I get often, I get asked all the time. Everyone's searching for it, and I'd be keen if you've got any thoughts as well. Because, and I, I appreciate there are so many different ways, but the the most common way of structuring an RPO price point, what are you seeing? Well, I don't. You know, the first thing is you need to um, spend some time talking to them about the number of people they've hired and the number of people they're intending to hire. So you've really got to get your handle on their workforce plan and the data. So you need to understand, you know, how many. You need to then do some mapping of how easy it is to be for you guys to fill those jobs. Um, and, you know, is it easy to fill jobs or is it difficult to fill jobs? Is there a hybrid? You've then got to really think about the, the, the team that you need to put on it. And, and there is a real difference in terms of account management because you need someone to manage the client relationship. You need to provide, provide data to the client. You need to um, work with hiring managers in a different way if you're, you know, you're quasi in-house rather than out -house, mm -hmm. outhouse. So you need to think about that. You know, you need a potential different delivery mechanism. So, I mean, it's completely different from a 360-degree yeah. recruiter where you have people that do all of that. You know, they do the selling. They talk to the candidates. They do. You know, this is someone, you know, you're going to segment their activity to support the client in a different way. Do they want to, what technology do they want to use? Have they got a system? Have you got a system? Are they using an ATS? They've got CRM. You know, there's a lot of questions. So I think one of the things I'd be saying is just don't, don't just try and embark on it in a sort of amateurish, let's have a go way, because I think you'll most probably have a painful experience and may, may learn some costly lessons. So I would say, think about the, what they expect you to do Think about the potential revenue that you would want. So it's a very different pricing. I wouldn't price it for job. I would price it on the volume and think about the activity required because you would be managing it in a slightly different way. Uh, and I could go into more detail. But no, I think that, that's perfect because we weren't going to talk about that. But I just thought because it's 
quite a hot topic I know that we're getting asked a lot about so um, that was really good thank you Kevin so I've got a couple of questions here I think um, just now I've got one, one anyway um, from Ian Robertson um, so Kevin um, and anybody just for a start on this one if anybody's looking for a question quite now uh, um, to, to add just pop it into the ask a question section or pop it into the comments as well and I'll be able to see it um, but Kevin are you seeing symptoms of this great resignation that everybody's talking about are, are you seeing it happening yeah, uh, there's definitely something. So you can see that, yeah, I, I, as always, it's, there's a lot of media hype, um, but there is no doubt that job fluidity has increased. Um, so there's two things that drive a jobs boom. So you have one, which is about new jobs being created. Now, you what you've had is because businesses shrunk during COVID, they're now expanding again. So they're creating jobs that are completely new, that no one's done for at least a year, perhaps. So that creates one way. The second wave is where people leave a job and take another job. And actually what then becomes their job, their job becomes vacant and someone then takes that. And that's called job fluidity. And when we get a boom in jobs market, you tend to have both at play at once. And that's what we've got. So we've got employers creating new jobs and people deciding to leave and, and take a new role. So there is an element of uh, increased uh, fluidity with more people. Now, some of that's driven by vacancies you know in lots of uh industries people are offering golden hellos you know we've got a massive driver shortage we've got in lots of parts of the labor market uh employers are are incentivizing people to join them so you there'll be lots of people that go oh i might as well take the opportunity so you'll you get the incentive driven stuff what you also get though i think is people being quite reflective you know a lot of my friends have taken this opportunity to retrain and become school teachers or do things that they never dreamt they would do because they had some time at home and they're on furlough or they weren't working or they were working part time or doing something different. And, and they thought about what do I really want to do? I've got another 10 years at work or 15 or 20 years, however long it may be. And I want to do something I enjoy. So I think there is a lot of things that are contributing to, you know, more people changing jobs. Yeah. But again, for a recruiter is if we get high job fluidity, and high job creation, you know, that's that's as it's good exciting, as it gets. Exciting, isn't it? <laughs> These are the golden days, you know, this is the this is the golden era. So um, long may it continue. But you've got to be good at what you do. You know, a lot of recruiters will be found out because if you can't find people to do the jobs, if you're not great at hunting out skills and talent for your clients, then you know they're not going to pay you a premium to do that. Yeah. No. Quite right. And on that note, I just wanted to come to a conclusion on this because that's been fantastic. Um, just wanted to take a few takeaways um, in terms of the, the three things that recruitment owners or recruiters can do right now to focus on to just, you know, get rid of the noise and focus on what, what matters. What would you what would you reckon the three takeaways from today? I mean, I would say. Um, focus. Don't don't get dragged into trying to do things you're not great at. What are you great at? What do you want to be famous for? How do you want to compete and differentiate yourself? So stick to your knitting. Be good at one particular part of the market or one particular type of job or one price point, whatever it may be. But be great at something. Don't just try and be everything to everybody. Clearly, that's number one. Secondly, is you've got to know where the candidates are. You've got to have, you've got to be doing the marketing to attract the candidates that other people can't find. So if it's passive candidates that are in jobs already, you've got to know where they are in your niche or your specialism so that you've got a chance of attracting them to your organization. Um, I thought I've got uh, two more. One is put your prices up. Now, if, you, if, if, you, if you're in demand, you've got more opportunity than you know what to do with. Price, use price as a differentiator. So put your prices up. If you were charging 14%, now charge 16%. And if you've got more opportunities and you can't fill all the jobs, go to six, you know, 18%. Now's your chance to increase the price because the, the client will perceive the value of what you're doing for them because they know it's difficult. And then finally, you've just got to be great at providing a great candidate experience because you've got to be, you've got to provide an experience where the candidate will keep coming back to you and will recommend you to other people that they know in the same space. So four things, but if you do those four things, you're not gonna go far wrong. That has been awesome. 
thank you so much and just laughing when Susie's just posted there I'd love that as well love love stick to the knitting and squeezing the pipes <laughs> yeah you got you got to be good at something you know I always say to, to recruit them is it what do you want to be famous for yeah. and that means you know no one could be good at everything mm-hmm. no one doesn't matter in what walk of life nobody's brilliant at 10 things but you can be brilliant at one you just got to pick your one and focus on it um and think about your training, think about the data points, think about how you get information, how you add value to your clients by being brilliant at that one thing. Kevin, thank you so much. And I think Andrew will be posting in, I think, um, a wee link to, to your book. And I think we've got an exciting, you know, second book on its way as well, if you meet your deadlines by Christmas. So that's going to be yeah. really good as well. So we look forward to hearing more about that. But, um, you know, by on behalf of everybody, we've had a great uh, turn up today. Um, I think it's been over 120 odd people that have been listening in. So that's awesome. Um, thank you for kicking off our fourth season. I don't know if I'm, I, I, I'm nuts or just mad by going through another year of doing Crowdcast every month. Um, but to our audience, uh, you know, I'll keep trying. Make sure that you get anybody you want me to talk, chat to. Just ping me a wee LinkedIn message or anything else as well. But um, thank you all for joining us, Kevin. Thank you for coming back, the friend of the fish. And uh, we'll love to probably get you back in about six to nine months then to tell me what next, if that's all yeah, right. Yeah, well, let's see whether it's come true. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'll play the recording back and we'll say, right, Kevin, did we do that? And everybody have fun in the boom. Uh, It is good times, but, you know, listen to the the words of wisdom there for Kevin. You you will not go wrong. But uh, thank you so much. See you again. Bye-bye.